So hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Hi. You guys need to be loud to talk to me because like oh. conversational. Yay. So we're going to have a conversation today. This is going to be boring. This is going to be fun. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. And I'm going to tell you probably more about myself than I tell the average person. So this is not going to be elevator pitch. This is going to be like long take a stroll pitch. Um, and I just think it's really important because I don't know what all of your backgrounds are. But I think it's important that you know that um, every entrepreneur who you see on Good Morning America who makes his or her way onto MSNBC um, did not come from a background necessarily where they had lots of money, where they knew how to be an entrepreneur, where any of this made any sense to them. Um, because it didn't make any sense to me. And in many ways, I'm figuring, out, figuring it out as I go along. So I'm happy to share the information with you because I want you to have something that I didn't necessarily have. And um, I want you to get exposure and first-hand access in ways that I didn't have it, but in ways that I'm getting it now, and I'm very grateful to be getting it now. Um, so my background is I was born in Oakland, California. I was the youngest of six kids. Um, I, my mother was an elementary school teacher in the Oakland School District, and my father was an elementary school teacher in the Oakland School District as well. Um, my mother and father divorced when I was two years old. My mom had a brain aneurysm and passed away when I was six years old. So all six of us had no parents. Um, my aunt, who lived across the way in El Cerrito, which is right near Berkeley, took all six of us in. So at the ripe old age of 35, she went from having one child to having seven children. And so she had a big task on her hands. As I tell people all the time, she didn't just like feed us and clothe us and say, hey, good, you have a roof over your heads. Um, she actually invested and made sure we studied and did extra homework, took me to debate practice on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and the reason I mentioned debate practice is because I had a Spanish teacher who told me that I needed to take public speaking. And I, no, I'm sorry, she told me I needed to join the debate team because public speaking would be important to me. You know what I told her? I will never choose a career where I have to speak in public because I am painfully shy and I don't want to talk in public. Right? So, and she said, it doesn't matter what career you choose, Tanya, you could be a doctor, you're going to need to speak in public. You could be a lawyer, you're going to need to be, speak in public. You're always going to need to present yourself. So, now we're fast forwarding to elevator pitch. Everything you do in your life is an elevator pitch. When you want to go get a job, that's an elevator pitch. When you shake someone's hand literally in the elevator and you have no idea who that person is or what opportunities that person can afford you, that's an elevator pitch. So I don't care if you don't like to speak in front of people, you don't think you'll ever have to speak in front of people, you're going to have to get over that and learn how to present and pitch yourself and anything else that you care about in order for you to be successful in life and get to where you want to go, no matter what you want to do. So I'm going to start there. So this elevator pitch component is extraordinarily important to you, whether or not you ever start a business. It is important to you in terms of how you represent yourself in life. So that's the first half of my background. So now I'm going to tell you the second half. My aunt raised me. I went to Stanford. I got two degrees in industrial engineering. Um, I didn't even know what industrial engineering was. I just wanted to get something with engineering on the end because I was like, we've been like broke all of our lives and I need to do something where I will be able to support myself. So I got these two degrees in industrial engineering and then my first um, internship was in a Pampers plant. And I walked into the Pampers plant and they said, here, put on these steel toe boots and put on this, uh, this um, what do you call it? I don't even know what those hats, the hard hat, thank you. I'm like, I don't even know what they are called. It wasn't a fedora, it wasn't cute. And I was like, oh my gosh, is this what I got myself into? So I didn't want to do that. Um, so I was like, no, I, I'm sorry. I thought I, thought I wanted this internship, but I really don't. So I bowed out of that internship and went and did some other stuff. And so all the other stuff that I did was typically working inside of company and figuring out how to help them to improve their internal processes. So what does that mean? That means that you know, their processes for paying their employees could take a long time and be really terrible. I would help to improve that. Their process for servicing their customers, sending, I was at the telephone company for a while, sending out trucks on time to service their customers, I was responsible for that. So I did a lot of that stuff and it was actually kind of, you know, kind of interesting academically, but kind of boring overall and not really about my passion and what I care most about. So fast forward and finally, I used all of those experiences with working with teams inside of companies to work on new product launches. And I was like, wait, so this I like, figuring out how do you build a new product? How do you get the product out the door? How do you market a product effectively and efficiently? So that's where I started to find things that were exciting to me. So where that eventually led me is I was at Cablevision. Anybody heard of Cablevision, cable company? 
So I launched their first telephone product. Remember back in the day when the cable companies weren't offering telephone services, but they were trying to compete with Skype and all of those voice over IP services? You guys are too young. Anyway, so I launched the first telephone product at the phone company. So that was kind of exciting, right? Like no cable company had launched a telephone service before, and my team did that. That was great. And then I moved over to ESPN. Any ESPN fans? Ah, yeah, see, now I'm talking your language, right? So I moved over to ESPN. Does anyone use ESPN3? Online? Okay, so I launched ESPN3. That was my team that did that, right, right, right. So you can go from, so part of this is also, you can go from something that's really, really boring to something that's really interesting and cool by just continuing to be good at your job and continuing to take steps closer and closer to where you want to be. So I launched that, and so now I'm being entrepreneurial, right? I'm launching new services, but I'm doing it inside of a big, a big company. I moved from ESPN over to Nickelodeon, and at Nickelodeon, I lead preschool and parenting. So nickjr.com and all digital. NickJr.com, Noggin.com, all of those websites online that are targeted at parents and kids. So now I've not only moved closer to a discipline that I care about, launching new products, I've moved closer to a subject matter that I care about. Sports is all right. I like sports, but I love kids. Kids is where my passion really is. So at, I'm sorry, at Nickelodeon did that, then moved to Discovery Education, and you know the Discovery Channel. They have an educational unit. They launch digital textbooks for classrooms and kids. That was something I, again, passionate about. Both my parents were teachers, so I did that. And then one day my daughter said to me, Mommy, my ninth birthday is, only co uh, is coming up. I only want two things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, good, so I don't have to think about what she wants. And I said, what do you want? And she said, number one, I hope people give me enough money so I can finish saving for an investment account. And number two, I want a bike. And I thought, she is going to get $300 worth of crap. People are going to come to the party and bring a sew your own purse kit, a make your own gum kit, a rainbow loom. Have you guys gotten any of this kind of stuff as you see now? Because you're young, see? Now I'm talking young folks language. So you guys have gotten a whole bunch of crap from people who loved you and were well-intentioned, um, but really didn't know what you want, wanted. And so I thought, this is craziness. $300 spent on her birthday towards stuff that she's never going to use. It's going to sit over in the corner of my apartment and just junk up my house. And I'm, not, I'm trying to teach her not values of consumerism and excess and waste. Instead, I'm trying to teach her the value of money and saving for the future, sharing with others, and spending on something that really matters to you. Because if you know those three things, and if you spend your money in those three ways all throughout your life, you take every check you get and you save some for the future, you share some with others, and you spend something only on things that matter to you, you're going to be rich. That's kind of all you need to know those three things. And I thought, I spend all year trying to teach her this. And then the birthdays and holidays come and undo this. I can do something about this. So I went and I talked to lots of moms and said, are you having this problem too? And every single one of them said, yes, I hate birthdays and holidays. It's ridiculous. My kids have way too much stuff and they just get more. And they should really be learning the value of money. And we should be using this money towards important goals in their lives instead of buying them more stuff. And that's when I launched ISO. And we launched, we officially launched the company, ISO, ISOW.com. The reason we called it ISO, we were initially called SO, SOW, because it means to plant seeds or to disperse seeds. And we are enabling kids to plant seeds for their future, not just kids, kids and young people like your age, plant seeds for their future and disperse seeds, meaning help other people with their future as well. That's the mission of our company and that's what we're all about. Um, and so we let you sign up for goals instead of goods in those three big categories. You can go online right now, and w the holidays are coming up. Who's going to get gifts that they don't want on the holidays? Raise your hand. You think so? Anybody getting anything they don't want? You think? Are people calling and saying, hey, what do you want for the holidays? Anyone getting those calls? Your parents, maybe. Yes? OK. Sign up at ISO, ISOW.com, and you can go in there and say, hey, here's what I want to save for. I want to save for my next set of tuition. I want to save for, co uh, I want to save for um, textbooks. These are the things I want to save for. I want to save for an investment account, like my daughter. Like everyone in here, instead of thinking about like, just having a savings account that earns no interest, an investment account over the long run is where you need to be putting your money. Um, if you had $100,000 today and you invested it in a, and you put it in a savings account, in 30 years, guess how much it would be? $106,000. 30 years. If you had $100,000 today and you invested it in the stock market in an investment account that basically looked just like the stock market, mirrored the stock market, guess how much you'd have in 30 years? $761,000. So that's what we're trying to teach young people. It's not enough to save anymore. You've got to invest your money and we're going to teach you how to do it. So that's the first thing. 
Second is go online and say a charity that you care about. There are so many charities that are doing good work right now. You can say a charity that you care about. And then spending whatever you really want for the holiday season, and that could be anything. If you really need a coat, you really need new winter boots, whatever. Then the people who love you can go check out your sew profile and say, instead of buying them something that, another gift card, who gets another gift card? Who wants another gift card, right? Instead of getting another gift card, I'm going to give $10 to their savings goals, $10 to their causes, and $10 to their wishes, or whatever proportion they want to give. So that's what we do. And we target parents and young people, and hopefully you guys will sign up. So now I'm going to talk to you about pitching. We're going to get back to pitching. I told you we were going to take a little bit of a walk. Was that useful, though? Yes? OK. Great. I'm glad that was useful. I want to be useful. When I stop being useful, just holler and say, Tanya, you're not being useful, and then we'll go down another tangent. OK. We're coming back to pitching now. So, um, so here's what we're going to do. I understand we have some folks in the house who are going to be ready to pitch at some point. I'm going to demonstrate a pitch first. Okay, so we got some folks who are ready to pitch. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate a pitch first. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the different um, uses of a pitch. Okay, so when we put together a pitch, who are we pitching to? A possible investor. A possible investor. Great answer. Who else could we be, be potentially pitching to? Competition. That's interesting. I probably, so I probably wouldn't go to my competition and say, here's how we're doing and here's how we're doing it. But competition will absolutely hear your pitch, definitely, when you're pitching on MSNBC or on Good Morning America. Um, the other group that we could be pitching to potentially is partners, right? Emily Glasser is here. Emily is responsible for our strategic partnerships um, at ISO. And so all day long, she is telling people why they want to work with us. We are only six months out the gate, and Emily is going, and she has to pitch people on why you, who has a million users over there, really wants to be down with ISO and help us to get even more users, right? So you have to understand that your pitch, you're painting a vision for people. There may not be things that they can benefit from you, um, can benefit by, by working with you today, but you're painting a vision for where you guys are going to go together in the future. And that's a big part of the pitch. Does that make sense? Cool. In that vein, by the way, there are several kinds of pitches. There's a one-minute pitch. There's a two-minute pitch. I understand you guys have been focused on two-minute pitches. One-minute pitch, two-minute pitch, five-minute pitch, ten-minute pitch. I just had um, a meeting yesterday where I pitched to some investors, and it was a ten-minute pitch with a five-minute Q&A. So your pitch has to be able to expand and contract based on what your audience is looking for and what the forum is. When you're in an elevator, you don't have time for a 10-minute pitch. So literally, if that's the only thing you've practiced on your business, you're hosed. Because you are probably only able to get out a tenth of the information that's important because you're fumbling and bumbling around here and you just missed out on an opportunity with a fantastic investor, partner, customer because you couldn't encapsulate what you needed to say in 60 seconds. Similarly, when you're in front of a group of investors who says, you have 10 minutes, and all you have memorized is that two-minute elevator pitch, guess what happens? They're like, that's all you got? Is there any depth to your business? What else can you tell me, right? So again, your pitch has to be able to expand and contract. So the key elements of the pitch I know you've talked about, right? You want to talk about what the problem is. You want to talk about what your solution is. You want to talk about what you're looking for, right? So there's a, 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 um, a, an ask in there in the pitch. Um, and you want to talk about what you're going to do with the money, et cetera. You know, again, depends on who you're pitching to, what you're going to do with that money once you receive it. Um, so, so those are the elements of the pitch that you're going to use to paint the picture. But again, you know, when you talk about what you're going to do with the money, in one minute, what you're going to do with the money is basically, I'm going to use it to acquire customers. If you have 10, minute, 10 minutes, what you're going to do with the money looks like, here's how I'm going to use these proceeds. I'm going to spend $100,000 on a chief technology officer. I'm going to spend $200,000 on marketing. I'm going to spend $300,000 on blah, blah, blah. You get it? So expand and contract. Um, so that's why pitches that are 10 minutes look different than pitches that are one minute, that look different than are pitches that are two minutes. And you got to practice all of them, right? So, and, and you will practice them according to how you need them. Because I'll tell you, right, I haven't done a one minute pitch in 45 days. So before I came in here with you guys, I had to like get my mind wrapped around my one minute pitch. I had to practice my one minute pitch. And don't believe that practice doesn't make perfect and that practice isn't necessary. I know far too many people who think they can wing their pitch 
It's not a good idea. You don't have one minute and 10 seconds. You don't have one minute and five seconds. So if you don't get out that you are trying to raise $1.5 million because you're out of time, you're out of time. The elevator door's open. They're gone. They're off to their next meeting. So you've got to really take seriously the fact that a certain amount of time means a certain amount of time. And literally, every meeting I've been to, when you're out of time, you're out of time. And they cut you off. People aren't nice about pitching. Don't think they are. They will cut you off. So my recommendation is you stand in front of a mirror and you practice. And you practice and you practice and you practice again. So when I was on MSNBC, the elevator pitch segment, segment that um, Ida just referenced, um, I was the first participant who had gotten two tens from the judges. I don't think I got two tens because I was better than any other participant who was on there. I think I practiced more. Um, and I wrote it and I said it in front of people and I asked what they thought and I got feedback. That's another thing. Feedback is a gift. Do not think that you are the smartest person in the room. If you're pitching to people, you want to know what people's response is to your pitch. So why not go pitch to your friend and say, what do you think about that? Did I leave anything out? Did you understand what my product was? Do you understand what I'm looking for? You pitch there first. You pitch in safe spaces first. And shame on you if you don't, because you've missed the opportunity. You get that one time to pitch. So if your pitch isn't excellent, you missed your opportunity, because you didn't want to go and ask for feedback from people who were close in your circle. OK, so those are all the things I'm going to say about a pitch. I'm going to do my pitch for you. I'll do a one minute pitch for you. Um, and then we are going to have your illustrious contemporaries and colleagues here um, do their pitch, and we'll give them some feedback. Does that sound good? OK, first I'm going to stop and pause. I lied. I'm not going to do my pitch yet. Questions? Yes? So you said your degree was in industrial engineering. Yeah. Did you have a problem getting to any of your jobs with that degree? Like, I mean, did any job accept me that are you because they said, hmm, your degree is kind of not in our range, not in our field? I love that you said that. So here's the interesting thing about industrial, or ask that question. Here's the interesting thing about industrial engineering. How many of you know what industrial engineers do? Yeah, that's right. No one out there does either. So when I was going and applying for jobs, no one knew what an industrial engineer was. And they would literally ask me in, you know, so here's what I had on my resume that was going for me. Stanford and engineering. And then I had a bunch of great internships that could demonstrate what I was trying to do. Um, but so how did I get my job? I pitched my degree. So what I told people when they said, what's industrial engineering? I said, it's really like a technical business degree. And what industrial engineers study is how to make an operation most efficient from a people perspective, from a process perspective, and from a money perspective. So I pitched my own degree. And I, I, I took them down the path that I wanted them to go down about what my degree was about, depending on what job I was applying for. So it wasn't like nursing where everyone knew that degree. It was something that was known, so you can kind of pitch your own. I had to. No one knew what my degree was. What, no one knew what my degree meant and what value I could bring to the company. So I had to frame it for them. And that's what you're going to have to do when you're pitching your company or when you're pitching yourself from a career perspective. OK, we ready? Cool. All right. Does anyone have a clock so you can cut me off? I'm going to practice what I preach. You got me. OK. I want you to tell me when to start and tell me when to stop. Ready? One minute. Hi, my name is Tanya Van Court. I formerly led digital products at NickJr.com, and now I'm CEO and founder of ISO.com. I started ISO because my daughter told me she really only wanted two things for her birthday, enough money to save for an investment account and a bike. That's when I realized that gift giving to young people needed a redesign. At ISO, we enable young people to sign up for important goals instead of more goods in three big categories, saving for their future, sharing with others, and spending on things that matter to them. We're raising $1.5 million, and we are endeavoring to get the word about ISO out to more people. We already have thousands of users, and that money will be spent on building out our team and spreading the word. We know that there's a 96 million people in our target market, and $130 billion was spent last year on gift cards alone. So our success will mean returns of up to 10 times for our investors. Thank you. So did you hear all the things I got in there? Can I ask one question? Right? Yeah. Where does the profit come from? So like, is it like a, like you take a percentage out of each thing? Three ways. Now, great question. Three ways. Number one, we take 5% on the top of every transaction that comes through. 
So when your grandma gives you $50, we will actually charge 5% on top of that, $52.50. Um, number two, we, our goal is to get young people into responsible financial vehicles, so investment accounts, et cetera. So we have a partnership with a partner, Wealthfront, and whenever we refer you over to Wealthfront and you open up a Wealthfront account, we will get um, a feedback from Wealthfront. And number three, if you say that what you're saving for is a bike or an iPad and you pull in a link from that website, once you have enough money to buy that, we'll pop up a buy now button, you'll go over to the website and we'll get an uh, affiliate feedback from that site. Yeah, we launched in December of last year and then we came out of beta in April. So we launched in December and we're literally just testing functionality, et cetera, through April. Um, and in May, we actually started to try to market. And when you market, one of the things that you have to do is look for product market fit. And you may think, wow, I know exactly who's going to use this product. And so, you know, I'm going to find that user. But you don't really until you get the product out there and go, oh, wow, college students like it better than high school students. Or moms of two-year-olds are avid users and way more avid than moms of four-year-olds. I mean, like, you literally have to segment and segment and segment until you find that, that audience. And so we just really started to figure out who our audience is and who has the greatest propensity to sign up for us. Okay. How do you advertise your business? Another great question. So we are doing strategic partnerships. Um, so we do partnerships with nonprofits as an example. So let's say there's a nonprofit called Camions of Care. They um, have 60 chapters of young women, high school and college age women across the country. We go to Camions of Care and say, you should go and tell all of your young women in your chapters to sign up for ISO and name Camions of Care as their cause. Because then when Uncle Johnny gives his niece Brandy $20 or $40 for her birthday and puts five of that into Camions of Care, then Camions of Care can make money in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. So uh, partnerships is one way. The second way is we're launching high school competitions. Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, whichever one of you signs up the most people for ISO, we'll give you $500 towards your prom or towards your, um, towards your homecoming. The third way is we're advertising <coughs> on Facebook. So we're advertising on Facebook, we are finding our users, segmenting our users, targeting our users. Facebook is great for targeted marketing, so we're doing that as well. So we have kind of a number of different strategies to figure out which one is most cost effective um, and will be best as a long-term strategy for scale. Right. Has anyone ever challenged, like, like not, like the mom who's sending you, like the grandma who's sending it, yeah. have they challenged you and said like, how do I know if the kids are gonna use it for this? Because you can all come to one PayPal, right? So like, yeah, they, they, well, that mom or the grandma hasn't. We've had investors who have asked that question. You know, our answer to that question is, ISO is not, people are like, well, is it crowdfunding? For us, it's not crowdfunding. It's kin funding, right? It's, it's your, the people who know you. And what I say to people is, I have one nephew who, whose name is Cole. Don't tell him if you know him. He lives in California. Mm -hmm. I would not give him $5 in a birthday card, let alone $50 on his ISO profile. Right? So whatever you would do for a person in, in person is likely what you're going to do for them via ISA because you know these people. Right? So, but my other nephew, Alex, he would sew for a new car. He would, you know, because he's young and <coughs> needs a new car and it's not something he can afford. He's in graduate school. He would sew for a new car. He would sew for, you know, things that I would absolutely contribute towards. And if he said, you know what, my priority shifted on Titania because I needed more money for my textbooks, I'd be like, that's okay. At least you had goals and are applying money in meaningful ways to those goals. So. One of the things that is really important to me, um, because I didn't always know a lot about money, um, is that we are also teaching young people about money, the language of finance, so that when we are talking to people about opening up an investment account, people know what that means and it doesn't feel scary. Um, when we're talking about compound interest, people know what that means and it doesn't feel scary. So we have launched what we call our Urban Financial Dictionary. It's called So Smart Money Talks. We're going to help you understand it. And we essentially use memes from recording artists, hip hop stars, etc. to explain the top 50 terms that you need to know about money. So here we have... So Childish Gambino is going to tell you about a cosigner. What we say, a cosigner is someone who signs a loan with you for responsibility on a credit card, loan, or lease, usually your mom or dad. What Childish Gambino says, I was hoping they see, see me just for me, dope rhymer, do me like my first house, no cosigner. So we are using their lyrics to then talk about what does this mean? What we can learn from the great Gambino. Many young adults need a cosigner when first applying for credit, blah, 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 blah. 
Look, so the point is that if there are any financial terms you're interested in or you want to know, please check out So Smart. I mean, it really is important that you understand money so that when you are going and getting a credit card and they talk about an APR, you know what that means and it's not scary to you. So what we're trying to do is really, you know, again, that's why we're not like GoFundMe. GoFundMe's not going to tell you anything about your money, anything about how to invest it, anything about how to save it. And we're going to tell you all. So I gave you a little of what I had. I'm going to ask you guys to please sign up for an ISO account. It would mean a lot to me, um, and it would mean a lot to our business. So if you guys are interested and said it's something that you're, you um, would be interested in doing, I would love to have you sign up and sign up for the holidays. And we also we have a refer a friend feature on the site. So for every friend that you refer back to our site and signs up, we'll give you five dollars. So that, yeah, so you want to raise money towards your goals. Look right. at that. Share the wealth. Get $5 yeah. towards your friends. Good point, Emily. So please spread the word. Yes. All right. Thank you, guys.